title of my message this morning is God, You're Killing Me. What a title to have, huh? As we study the book of Philippians. Well, this is an interesting title. A couple of uh, years ago, while I was on a job and uh, was working with a co-worker of mine, and one of, the, um, one of my co-workers and I, we were working on some financial reports, and what ended up happening is that the boss, our big boss, was not very happy <laughs> with some of the work that we were producing, and it just had a lot to do with some miscommunication, and then one day I opened up my email, and I just get this email directed to both of us, and she's like, She's like, you guys are killing me! So, and I never forgot that. And it reminds me that when I read Philippians chapter 2, and I read that whole chapter from verses 1 through 30, those words echo in my, in my mind. God, you're killing me. Uh, because that's exactly what God wants to do to your flesh. And he Amen. wants to do it to, your, to, our, to, to the self, so to speak. So when you read Philippians chapter 2, it is probably one of the most unselfish you'll ever read. It's not pleasant to the flesh, it hurts the flesh, but it is so necessary. <coughs> Amen? So, just a little background on Philippians chapter 2, and it's just to say it this way, that you have to remember when Paul was writing this letter to the church of Philippi, and some of you already know this, but when he wrote this letter, he was writing to thank the Philippians for their gift that Epaphroditus had sent them, or that the church of Philippi, Philippi had sent Paul while he was in prison under house arrest while in Rome. And so Paul is writing a thank you letter back to the church of Philippi. And it is one of the most joyful letters written of all times. And it has more than, I think, 15 or 16 words for rejoice or joy that are in it. And the interesting thing is that here's a man who's in prison, locked up, and yet he writes with more of a note of joy than in any other letter that he had that he had wrote, which really is a testament, a testament to the fact that everything doesn't have to be going perfect in your life in order for you to have the joy of the Lord. Now, the joy of the Lord is a byproduct, not of your circumstances, but it's a byproduct of your relationship with Jesus Christ. So all hell can be going on around you and about you, but you can have joy in the midst of your trial. Now, one of the things we did say, and I want to be very careful to highlight this, is that when Paul was writing this letter, he was not necessarily writing to address particular problems in the church. He was writing to thank the church. However, with that said, that doesn't mean that there were not problems at the church at Philippi. Because when we read through the letter, we do discover that there are some problems there. And there are some issues that he's dealing with. Like any church, most churches have little issues. Most churches have problems. I don't know of any churches that are perfect except ours. So that's my way. But, um, you know, I mean, there's the old saying that, you know, the, the church is imperfect because you got there. That's when it became imperfect. That just means that we're people. We make mistakes. We don't always... We don't always say the right things. We don't always do the right things. Sometimes we get into arguments and things of that nature. And, and, but if you're not careful, that can cause division and it can cause schisms. In fact, they say that uh, the number one reason why churches divide is because of arguments rather than heresy. Heresy is not the number one reason why churches split. It has more to do with arguments and families and people going through things. And I, I see it from you know in different churches and so on. And I'm not at, at liberty to say who or what, but it does happen. And so Paul is arguing in Philippians chapter 2 for the unity of the Spirit. And what he's really saying here is you guys got to put your selfishness aside, put your selfish ambition aside, put all the things that you want and put in trying to exalt yourself, lay that aside, lay your agenda aside so that Christ's agenda can succeed. So that's really the nature of Philippians chapter 2. But the problem with it is that it hurts the flesh. Because we all want to impose our own views, our own ways, our own agenda, and we don't want to take Christ's agenda, or Christ's views, and Christ's way, and make that our lifestyle. And so that's why it's a, it's a chapter that it hurts the flesh. Because it's, what God is asking us to do is to lay aside what we want to do in order so that, so that his will can succeed. Amen. So let's start reading in chapter uh, 2, verse 1. I believe Brother Victor is going to help us as we go through this. I don't have it on PowerPoint. But we're going to just go through just a couple of verses. So um, the first four verses, the Apostle Paul is going to uh, give 
four rhetorical questions. He's going he's gonna to basically couch it under four questions that he's going to ask, and then he's going to follow through. Just watch this. He, and he does it through, and you might want to underline this in your Bible, when he uses the conditional, phrase, the conditional word, if. So he says, therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing or fellowship in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So the Apostle Paul is saying that, look, if you're walking with the Lord, if you have been united in Him, if you have been comforted by the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have any fellowship with the Spirit, if there's any tenderness or compassion in your heart, he says, make my joy complete by being like-minded, by being one in spirit, is what he's saying, and of one mind. He's arguing for unity because he knows that there are certain Christians there that are going their own way with their own agenda and are not following God's way. This is a church that you have people on one side of the leadership that are wanting to pursue one thing and then people on the other side of the leadership that are pursuing another thing. And he's saying, look, you can't have that. Anything with two heads is a monster. Anything with two visions is not complete. It's not right. He's saying bring those visions together under one head. Be like-minded. Be one with each other. And I would submit to you that if we're going to have any power as a church, we have to be unified. We have to be one in purpose and one in mind. And I may sound like a broken record, but, uh, but at least you'll get it. But our vision, our mission, our vision is to make disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to come together and worship the one true God. And, and it is also to come together and to reach people all over the world, to do missions and to do evangelism and to utilize our gifts to serve one another and to serve this world. That is what we are about. And also, not only that, but to come together and fellowship and have that connection and to connect with one another. We are a connecting church. That's what we do. That's one of the things that I think separates us from all the other churches is that we come and we connect with each other. That's why we have a cafe. That's why we have different you know, things that, to get involved in. And you have different groups. You have a ladies group. We have a Wednesday night Bible study. And you have your, your youth. And you have your children. And you have your different, you know, different groups that are here. And we want, to, we want to see all of that grow. And we want to see it increase more and more and more and more. But if we're going to accomplish that, if we're going to fulfill the vision that God has given this church, we're going to have to do it under one mind, one spirit. We're going to have to be like-minded. There's no other way that we're going to be able to accomplish it. So we cannot have two visions in this house. And Paul is saying to the church at Philippi that if you're going to accomplish what the Lord wants for your life, and you're going to do it. You can't be looking. Look what he says. You can't, you can't serve your own purpose. Look at verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. One of the Greek words is empty glory. Like you're going to do something so that you can make a name for yourself. Or, or you're, going to, you're going to serve God so that you can, you can get a reputation. Or, or you're doing, you know, it, it all goes back to motives. Like why do you do what you do? So if you, if you gave somebody $20 to a homeless man, why did you give him that $20? Did you give it to him so that others, you know, when they saw you give it to them, you, you could be seen when you gave it to them? Or did you give it to that person because there was a real heartfelt need and you saw this person in need? You know, so it goes back to motives. And that's what you'll be rewarded upon in eternity is your motives for why you do what you do, not necessarily for just the very actions themselves. Because you can do something and if your heart isn't in it, there's no reward in that. If you're serving in this church and you're, and you're just doing things just to do it for the sake of doing it and your heart's not in it, there's no reward in that. So God wants your heart to be in everything that you do. And that's what he wants. And he doesn't want you to do it out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And, you know, as I grow in the Lord, one of my prayers has been, Lord, less of me and more of you. Amen. Less of me. I don't want people to see me. Let them see the Jesus in me. That's what I truly, truly want. Five years ago, I probably couldn't say that. You know, I may have, you know, there might have been some vain conceit there. 
just to be honest with you. But the more I grow in the things of God, I'm more, I'm more of, Lord, I don't care about me. I don't care about being popular. I want them to see Jesus because that's who this is all about. This isn't about a man. This isn't about a, this isn't about a movement. This isn't about your favorite preacher or who preach good or who can't preach good. It's about Jesus. That's what this whole thing is all about. That's why Paul said, who am I? He said it to the church at Corinth. He goes, one, you know, you say, I follow Apollos, or I follow this preacher, I follow, you know. And Paul said, who are we but men? He said, I'm just one who planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's all about him. That's what it's all about. So it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about Jesus. And so my goal is that I become less and he increases. Amen? Amen. So he says this in verse 4, don't look. He says, rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. It's the end of verse 3. He says, not looking to your own interests, interest, but each of you to the interests of the others. Now, folks, this is the killer part because that is the part where it hurts. Because he's telling us, don't look to your own interests. Look to the interests of others. And that hurts because that requires selflessness. Anything else other than that is selfishness. It's not easy to serve other people. It's not easy to do things that you know you should be doing for a family member, but you know you don't want to do it for that family member. You know, it's not easy to come to church and serve and give up your time and give up your resources, but God asks you to do that. And so he's asking us to not... Look to your own interest, but to look to others. Now, has anybody perfected that? Absolutely not. Nobody has perfected that. But we're all on the same journey. We're all traveling the same route. And that's, that's our goal. Is to That's where God says, I want to put to death the self so that I can live in you and through you so that people can see me. You see, when you die to self, when you die to your interests, and you die to your ambitions, then more of Jesus can shine through you. But if it's all about you and it's all about me, then people can't see the Christ in you. They just see you. They see flesh. That's why God wants to kill you. <laughs> just be careful with how you word that language, okay? <laughs> all right? We're talking about the self. Now, he's going to shift gears and he's going to show us the ultimate person or example of what this looks like. He's going to show us who personified what we're talking about perfectly. And watch this in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Or I like the King James, it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He's saying, take on this mindset that Christ also had. That's really what he's saying. What I'm about to share with you, Paul is saying, is I want this mindset to be in you because it was also in Jesus. The, the mindset that Jesus had on how he looked at things, I want this to be in you. That's what Paul is saying. Let in other words, have the same mind as Christ. The way Jesus thought about what I'm about to share with you, I want you to think about this as well. I want you to adopt this. I want you to internalize this. If Jesus thought about it this way, I want you in your mind to think about it exactly the way he thinks about it. That's what he's saying. And here it is. Verse 6. Talk, talking about Jesus. Now, verses 6, we're going to read verses 6 through 11. Now, verses 6 through 11 is considered by scholars to be an early church hymn. It's an er, considered to be an early church hymn that Paul may have adapted and interjected into his letter to the Philippians. And so it reads like this. Who, being in very nature God, talking about Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledged that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the Apostle Paul is saying that Jesus came to this earth as a man, as a God-man, so to speak. He was fully God, and he was fully man. He was not half God and half man. He was fully God and half, I'm sorry, fully man. 
and he left heaven. He left heaven for earth. He left a, a throne for a cross. He left a, a, he left a crown for a crown of thorns. And he took his God divine attributes and he emptied himself of them. He set them aside. That's what it says that he emptied himself. And that literally is the Greek word kenosis or kano, which is an emptying of the self. And scholars say it this way, that he laid aside his divine attributes in order to become a man. So that's, what, that's essentially what he did. He put aside his rights as God and became a man. That's why when the devil tempted him in the sermon, when we get to Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, and the devil tempted Jesus and said, turn these stones to, to bread. He was tempting Jesus to act like God, because he was fully God, and use his God-given powers to transform those stones into bread. And Jesus said, no, man, man, I'm fully man, does not live by, by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth of God. See, he was humbling himself. He, what was he doing? He was becoming a man. He was fully God, but he had to be, he had to become like a man in order to take our place. And there's also other connotations there as well that have to do with the gifts of the Spirit. And I don't have time to get into all of that. But as scholars have said that he laid aside his rights as God. Didn't make him any less God, but he laid aside his rights as God in order to become a human being. And because it because a human had sinned, Adam had sinned, and now a human had to bring redemption. So Jesus had to become a human. He couldn't just stay as God. He had to be a God-man in the flesh. Flesh had to be crucified. Blood had to be shed in order to make it right. That's the truth. And it was sinless, spotless blood that washes and cleanses our sins. It wasn't ordinary blood. It was the blood of a man, but it was sinless and spotless and blameless. Not a wrinkle or a stain of sin inside his blood. That's why the devil had no right to keep him. That's why he couldn't touch him. Because he was spotless. The spotless, sinless son of God. And that flesh that was poured out, he became obedient to death, the Bible says. So he went to the lowest place that a human being could go, which was to death. And he was crucified. And that's for our salvation, for our redemption. So Paul is saying that Jesus Though he was like God or is God, he became a man. He emptied himself and he became a man and he became a servant and he, he became obedient to death. And Paul is saying that because of that, or, or in other words, look at Jesus as your model now. The mindset that he had, that Jesus said, I'm going to empty myself, I'm going to become less, so to speak. And he says, I want you to have that mindset as well. I want you as a people to have that mindset. And I want you to learn how to serve one another out of selflessness instead of selfishness. And I want you to serve me, Jesus says, out of selflessness and instead of out of selfishness. Whose agenda are you pursuing? Are you pursuing your own agenda or are you pursuing God's agenda? We ought to be pursuing God's agenda. But don't just stay there because something beautiful happened. In this, because Jesus, as, as the Apostle Paul says, that as he became obedient to death, and he left that model really for us to show the servanthood of Jesus, that's really what he's arguing for, he said, This is the ultimate expression of humility. That's why at the top of your chapter 2 in Philippians, it says, Imitating Christ's humility. That's what this whole chapter is about. I just decided to call it God, you're killing me. But it's, it's imitating Christ's humility. That's what it's really all about. And it hurts, and it hurts the flesh. But he says, if you'll do this, now watch this in verse 9. It says, because Jesus did this, therefore, or because of what Jesus did, he says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. In heaven, some translations say, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should acknowledge and confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And by the way, that's a, that's a reference from Isaiah chapter 45, verses 23 through 25, and also Romans 14, 11. It's actually an old covenant reference, believe it or not. But he says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. I mean, that astounds me. He says every knee will bow in heaven, every knee will bow in the earth, and every knee will bow under the earth. Do you know what he's saying there? Every knee, every angel in heaven will bow. Every person in heaven will bow their knee 
to the Lord Jesus. Every person, every being on earth will bow their knee to Jesus. And every being under the earth, the underworld, the demon powers, wherever they might be or whatever is under the people that are in hell, will bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. One way or another, because he says every tongue will confess, every knee will bow and say that Jesus is Lord. Isn't that amazing to think of people like Hitler will bow the knee one day and actually confess and say Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. I mean, my goodness, the worst despot, the worst human being that has ever walked the face of this earth will bow its knee and to think about it and that the devil himself will one day bow his knee and say Jesus is Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Give the Lord some praise for that. That's right. That's exactly right. But he says because Jesus, he humbled himself that God exalted him. You see, folks, when you lay aside your agenda, God will bless you. When you lay aside your agenda and put your selfishness aside to pursue God's agenda, God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to exalt you. How do I know? Because the Bible's full of those, full of that. The, James chapter 4, I think it's verse 3, says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Hallelujah. Matthew, I think, there's a reference that says, If you humble yourself, he will exalt you. It's over and over. I think in the Proverbs, that you know, the one who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Right. So it's just, it's just the principle. So when we lay aside our agenda and humble ourselves, God says, okay, I'm going to exalt you. Now, I don't know exactly how God exalts you in every single situation, but I just know that it means he's not going to let you stay down for very long. He's not going to let you stay in your, your mess and so forth and so on. Or he's going to somehow see to it that he blesses you. And whatever that might look like is maybe different for each person in this room. But nonetheless, when there is humility, there is exaltation. That's just the way God works. And if you think about the people who God used, you know, people who were nobodies. And I was just reading a commentator how <laughs> this commentator said, it's, he said, it's amazing how God anoints morons. <laughs> He uses people that are the most least likely to be chosen. And he called them morons. You know, and then he said, you know, look at David, for example. David really was a nobody. It really was. When, they, when Jesse was going to come anoint the next king of Israel, they didn't even bring David into the house. They had all the other brothers come. And Jesse, when he saw them, he said, surely this is the Lord's anointed. He said, this one is the Lord's anointed. My black and hours are getting darker in here. Okay, I don't know why. Anyway, it's probably the electrical stuff we got. Going. All right. But he says, this is the Lord's anointed. He saw the one who's tall and he's handsome. And the Lord said, no, I have not chosen him. And he went right down the list. And finally, Je Jesse ran out of people. His sons, there were no more sons to choose from that were there in the house. And, and Jesse said, you know, there's God. Or Samuel, I'm saying. Not, uh, Jesse was the father. Yeah. But Samuel had come down to the house and was anointing. It was going to anoint the next king of Israel. And when he got, finally went through all the sons, Samuel asked Jesse, where, do you have any more? And he goes, yeah, there's one more. He's in the back. He's tending the sheep. Dirty old rugged boy. David. A harp player. Playing in the desert. Nobody knew who he was and nobody. And Samuel said, go bring him. Bring him in. And man, the moment he walked through that door, the Spirit of the Lord said to Samuel, that's your man right there. That's your boy. Pour your flask of oil over on him. That's the Lord's anointed. And think about that. He was a nobody. And God said, I'm going to make him a somebody. And he became the next king of Israel. Folks, you may be a nobody today, but God can do something spectacular with your life. If you'll let him. Glory to God. Look at Moses. Moses is another one. You think Moses is a great big deliverer? Other than the fact that he was a murderer? And the fact that when God appeared to him, he said, I'm going to use you to go and deliver my people Israel. And Moses said, he said, God, he goes, I can't go. And God said, why? He says, because I can't talk very well. He goes, I stutter. He was a stutterer. So I'm sure Moses is probably thinking, if I go to Pharaoh, this is what it's going to sound like. <laughs> Let the people go. That's the kind. I'm not trying to make fun of people that stutter, but that's exactly what he's got in his mind. And God's, he's like, God, I'm not going. 
But God was so gracious that he said, Moses, who gave man his mouth? Who gave him his mouth? And he says, you know, and Moses finally, he just says, I, I'm not doing it. And God says, fine, I'll have, your bro I'll have your brother Aaron do it. And finally, that's how they got to go. But here's a, a nobody. And God says, I'm going to make him a somebody. I'm going to make him a deliverer. You see, in your humility, in your lowest place that you are, God says, I want to raise you up from where you are. And I want to make you a somebody. And then the last one is my favorite, is Peter. Peter is just, I mean, he's the one who's always putting his foot in his mouth. He's the one who denies the Lord Jesus. I mean, he denies him three times. Three times. And, you know, and he's always got his foot in his mouth. He's always saying the wrong thing, whatever. He rebukes Jesus and says, no, you'll never go to the cross. And Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, devil. You know, I mean, he's always doing the wrong thing. And the guy who is voted least likely player on the team gets voted for MVP. Yep. Most valuable player. Yeah. Well, how do I know? Because Jesus said, I'm, I'm you, Peter. I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. The church was built on the name of Peter. How about that? Right? A nobody, a person always putting his foot in his mouth, as this one commentator said, a moron. God says, I'm going to build my church on him. How would you like that? God's church is built on morons. Huh? Do you know why God does that? Because so he gets the glory. Amen. So you and I can't boast. Amen. Because if you could do it, and I could do it, Guess what? You don't need him. You don't need him. And you would get the glory. You get the, then. But God said, no, I want to get the glory. I'm going to get the glory. Amen? Amen? So in your humility, in lowering yourself, there is exaltation. And so praise God. So now let's, let's go forward. Let's just kind of finish this out. Look at verse 12. And we'll look at verses 12 through 18. Uh, Paul is on the same topic here. He's not really s switching gears. He says, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, I love this, this verse here because it says that, he says, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, watch this. Look at verse 13. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in accordance, in accordance, in order to fulfill His good will. Now, do me a favor. Underline in your Bible, right there in verse twelve. Underline the word "work out." So He says, "Continue to work out." Underline that those two words, and then jump down to verse thirteen and underline the words "works in you." For it is God who works in you. His Will to act in, or, in order to fulfill his good pleasure. But I just want you to underline in verse, at the end of verse 12, underline work out. And then verse 13, underline works in you. Now I want you to put those two words together. What God is saying here is that he works in you so that you can work it out of you. Is what he's saying. God works his grace and his power in you so that you can work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Right. Or you can reverse it the other way. It's we are working out our salvation because of the fact that God is working in us to will and to act. What he's really saying is that, folks, in your own strength, you can't do anything. It's nothing but the power of God in you that empowers you and enables you to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And so everything we do, so when God is asking you to humble yourself and be selfless, and what he's saying is, I want you to repent. Re to depend and rely upon my strength to do it. Don't try to do it in your own strength. Don't try to live this thing out in your own strength. Don't try to act in your own strength, in your own power. You have to, every day you get up and you get on your knees before God and you say, Lord, give me the strength today to live this walk out before you. Give me the strength to love my outlaws, I mean my in-laws. Give me the strength to love them today, oh God. Because you're going to need it. Because in your own strength, you can't do it. Because in your own strength, you feel like strangling your outlaws. I mean, your in-laws. So, but that's just the way it is. So God gives you the grace and the strength to do what you can't do for yourself. Amen? Amen. So then he says in, in verse 14, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. When Paul says do everything without grumbling or arguing, 
there may be, some scholars think that there may be some legal connotation there. The word for arguing has a reference to the first Corinthians chapter six where Paul told the Corinthian believers, stop taking each other to court. Stop arguing over these cases. These are, these are cases that you shouldn't be arguing before the world. And he's saying, and he might be saying here that he's telling the Philippians that whatever disputes you have between each other, stop arguing amongst yourself. Stop grumbling over these things. And, you know, settle, settle them yourselves. And, you know, make things right between your neighbors. Stop fighting with each other. Stop arguing. And he says, and then you'll be blameless and you'll be pure. And you'll be pure children without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And he says, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word, to the word of life. The Bible likens you like a star. You're likened unto a star in the sky. And the world is full of darkness. And, the people, and there are people in the world that are full of darkness themselves. And, but he says that as my people, as Christians, you are my stars. And as you walk this life out called Christianity, you're going to be like the stars in the sky. And I don't have time to go there, but there's other references in Daniel and other places in the Bible that talks about God's people that they will shine like the stars. Wow. That in eternity, we're going to shine like the stars. And I remember one pastor said, and I don't know how true it is, but he said that there's going to be different degrees of people in heaven. That not everybody's going to have the same level of glory because we're all going to be at a different level of glory. Because the Bible says that we go from glory to glory. And he said there's going to be some, and Paul talks about this in Corinthians, that some are going to get saved by the skin of their teeth. That they're going to be saved, but they're not going to have anything to really show for it. And they're going to kind of be like the stars that are kind of like, they look like they're kind of going out. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then you're going to have people that did these great things for God. And they, they loved the Lord. And they, they prayed for their church. And they, they just, you know, they were baking cookies when no one else wanted to bake the cookies. They were cleaning the cafe when no one wanted to clean. And they were faithful. And maybe nobody knew, knew them. But yet they were, they were shining bright stars. Like, whoosh. Beacons of light. Now, I don't know how true, how all that's going to play itself out, but folks, I don't want to be a fizzling light. I don't want to be a shooting star. I don't know about you, but I do believe there are rewards, and the Bible talks about that. Maybe at a later time we'll preach on that again, you know, on the rewards of heaven and all those things. And so Paul says that as you act this way, as you sacrifice, as you learn to love each other and stop the grumbling and stop the argument, he says you're going to shine like stars. In this world, as you hold forth that word and hold forth that truth. Amen? Amen? And then he says this in verse 17. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering, um, the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, if you notice, if you're, if you're very quick in your Bible, you'll miss this, but underline the word drink offering. Because the drink offering was a, was a, a wine offering. And this is the way God prescribed it. Um, it had to be, it was a wine offering. It was called a drink offering. And you took that wine and you mixed it onto the sacrifice. And when the sacrifice, when it was poured on that, what ended up happening is that the aroma from the fire and the sacrifice would just go right up into the nostrils of God. And it would become a sweet smelling aroma in the eyes, in the nostrils of God. And that's why you mixed your sacrifices with the drink offering. And so Paul says, I'm like this drink offering that's being poured out upon the altar and sacrifice of your faith. So what he's saying here is that together, with us together, we are like a drink offering. And then as we serve one another and as we live this life called Christianity out before God and before each other and as we serve one another, we're being poured out like a drink offering. And guess what? Our service before God and our walk before him is like a sweet aroma in the nostrils of God. Isn't that beautiful? And it says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. And so that's why it's hard. Because you know what? When nobody wants to do the work and nobody's around and you pick up the plow to do what God's calling you to do, you become like a drink offering and you become an aroma as a sweet savor, sweet smell unto the Lord. Now here's, now we're going to close here. Uh, in verses 19 through 30, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just read a, a select, couple of select verses, but Paul is going to just highlight, he's going to basically finish up chapter 2 with saying, folks, let me give you the ultimate, ex supreme, well, now I wouldn't say ultimate examples, but let me give you two examples of what I've been talking about this whole time. That's what he's saying. And he's going to reference Timothy and Epaphroditus. 
And what he's going to say is that I have nobody like these guys. Timothy and Epaphroditus have served me. They have labored with me. They have given me what you could not give to me. And they have basically poured themselves out on the sacrifice of your of your faith, of their faith. And in fact, Epaphroditus, the Bible says, they almost died for the work of the Lord. And he's now sending him back to the church at Philippi with this letter. And he's going to basically have that letter read to them. But what Paul is saying is that both Timothy and Epaphroditus really are exemplary examples, if you will, of what I've been just talking about as what a life of sacrifice is about. And so, I, and so he's saying, you and I, they're really our model, with Jesus being the ultimate supreme expression of what it means to be selfless. But here's some real flesh and blood examples, two people, and this is what he says, look. Verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheerful when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. Does that sound familiar? If you back up and you read verse 4, or verse 3 and 4, Paul says, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each one to the interests of the others. But here in verse 21, he says, for everyone looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus. He's saying that Timothy is not looking out for his own interests. See, he's, a, he's the example of what he's, what he's been talking about here the whole time. He says, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, you serve with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. Uh, now watch, he's going to talk about Epaphroditus now. So he's already spoken of Timothy as this example of selflessness and who has served me. And now he's going to switch and talk about Epaphroditus. He says he's my dear brother, my co-worker, and my fellow soldier. So three things about him there. Who is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you in his distress because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but also... On me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow, therefore I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety, so then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. This man really epitomizes what it means when we say, God, you're killing me. This man labored for the kingdom of God, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ, to serve this man, almost, and it almost cost him his life. Stand to your feet. But I think it's just such a beautiful example of two individuals here that Paul is saying these two guys right here are the extreme or the ultimate examples and expressions of what it means to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fact that they have laid aside their own agenda in order to fulfill God's agenda. And friends, the question is for you this morning is are you willing to lay aside your agenda so that you can fulfill his agenda? Whatever he's asking you to do. If you could say, Jesus, I want your agenda. I don't want my agenda. I want you just to lift your hands to the Lord right now with me. Let's just pray. Let's just pray and let me pray for you and, let's, and we're going to get you out of here. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you, Lord. We give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor. We thank you, Lord, right now, God, as we come before you, Lord.